Okay, now that we've talked about the background, let's talk about the questions that we need to ask ourselves when researching and debating this resolution. The first question is what kind of assistance is needed and what kind of topical action can NATO take? In terms of what kind of assistance is needed, NATO is primarily a military alliance. The question here is, can NATO members taking uniform action that is non-military still count? So for instance, if every country in NATO were to give financial aid to Ukraine or impose sanctions on Russia, is that NATO action because they are NATO members? Or are we talking specifically about the relationship between NATO and Ukraine? Obviously, Khan wants the narrower definition, Pro wants the wider definition. Pro wants to have more options. The other question is, what can we do to strengthen a relationship that isn't offering a plan? And the only real way to analyze that is to look at the literature and see what ways people talk about NATO strengthening its relationship and what that means. Usually, that means stationing troops nearby, supplying military aid, supplying training, supplying material but non-financial aid, or conducting joint military exercises. It could also mean a verbal show of support or a more formal mutual defense agreement than currently exists. An extreme of this spectrum would be suddenly admitting Ukraine into NATO, which would, as a member of NATO, mean that any attack on it would be considered an attack on all NATO members. That said, Pro probably does not get to pick which one of these to advocate. It's more a question of, should the relationship be strengthened? Is NATO part of the solution or not? So while there are a lot of different kinds of assistance, they really matter more in terms of how would NATO go about doing this than which would we like to pick to debate. The second big question is, what will Russia do next? And that's a question that matters in two ways. The first way is just that this is a topic that can change a lot. Between now and when you debate these rounds, Russia could have invaded. The northeastern part of Ukraine could have seceded. Russia could have backed down. NATO could have issued a very strong statement. NATO could have backed off. For instance, over just the past week, the number of cities in Ukraine controlled by separatists have tripled. Three aircraft from the Ukrainian military have been shot down by Russian weapons. The second-in-command of NATO has said that NATO no longer considers Russia an ally, but considers it an enemy. Forty-two more people were killed when Ukrainian special forces and totally not Russian paramilitary forces clashed. All of that was just in the past week. In late May, Ukraine gets a government, if the elections go according to plan. That government will have its own stance. People in the interim government, people from the largest opposition party to Yanukovych in Ukraine, have advocated the use of weapons of mass destruction on Moscow if anybody has the means to do so. It is a volatile situation that can certainly change for the better or the worse between now and then, and if it changes for the worst, this debate topic is the least of the casualties there, but it's certainly still something that's going to change. If that happens, the only thing you're really going to be able to do is debate it as a counterfactual. Should NATO have strengthened its relationship more and should it have strengthened it earlier, or was that part of the problem? So that would be a question that you might have to ask then, but otherwise this resolution is in the present tense, so long as the present is debatable when that comes up. What will Russia do next is also a question of what are Russia's intentions in the future. Not just between now and the tournament, but what are their intentions in the future when you are debating this at the national championships. And that can be a question of, does Russia just want Ukraine to be unstable so it can indirectly control them? Does Russia want to take in every part of Ukraine with an ethnic Russian majority? Does Russia just want NATO to back off and doesn't really care about Ukraine in and of itself? Is Russia going to cave to financial pressure once major business interests start demanding that they cooperate with the international community? 
our recent developments with how NATO views Russia or how Russia views the EU going to change things between now and then? What happens if we do nothing? Will things just run their course? Will they get worse? Those are the questions that actually matter in terms of what will Russia do next and how does that affect the costs of action versus the costs of inaction. The third question to ask is what parallels exist? What situations can we compare this to? Nobody knows the future. Nobody has a crystal ball. The one thing we do know about Vladimir Putin is that he prides himself on seeming unpredictable. He's very good at not committing to a set formula of behavior, and he's very proud of the fact that he can predict what other countries will do more easily than they can predict what he will do, in large part because he doesn't have to be as predictable because he's accountable to fewer people, and the Russian foreign policy establishment is very flexible in terms of doing what he wants. So we need to look at historical examples, historical parallels, to be able to make empirical arguments and look at predictions. The most direct parallel would be the Russian invasion of South Ossetia, which is a northern province of Georgia, another former Soviet state which borders Russia, which had Russian military intervention supposedly in response to domestic instability, but as both Russian and foreign analysts have said, it was probably provoked by NATO making overtures to Georgia by Russia feeling that NATO was getting too close and throwing its weight around. In that case, there was verbal condemnation from NATO, the US, and the EU, but no one really did anything about it. And again, that was August of 2008 that that happened. So that's the most recent example of that. Obviously, other parallels exist too. The Cold War has a wealth of historical parallels. Many people will talk about this as possibly being the start or the signal of an already started Second Cold War. Other parallels would be other former Cold War powers who also feel that their influence in their region should depend on their historical borders or their historical sphere of influence rather than their present situation. And the main example of that is China, which has said that the areas it used to control in the South China Sea are areas it should still have influence over regardless of what Japan or South Korea or the Philippines or Malaysia have to say about it. So definitely parallels there as well. And the way that other regional alliances have responded to those might show a blueprint for how NATO should or should not respond to this. The next big question is what are the stakes? What are the impacts? What's going to matter here? Is it a question of does a second Cold War start or not? Is it a question of is Ukrainian sovereignty at stake? Is NATO's credibility as an alliance, is NATO's reason for existing in the 21st century at stake? Is World War III at stake? There are a lot of different impacts that can be brought in, but generally speaking, you want to worry more about the smaller and more immediate ones than the bigger and more far-fetched ones. If World War III could happen as a result of this, however unlikely, then that would mean that Ukraine would be the starting point for it, the flashpoint, the tinderbox, the catalyst, what have you. That means that whichever side controls conflict in Ukraine, whichever side is able to say, we cause it or we prevent it, is the side that can control whether or not that happens. So if one side is arguing World War III is really, really, really bad, and the other side is arguing our side makes Ukraine more peaceful and reduces the chances of any conflict, that includes a third world war. So don't worry about the magnitude of the links, sorry, the magnitude of the impacts, worry about the directions of the links that access the impacts. I don't care who has the scariest hypothetical war that could happen, I care about which side does the most to avoid a probability of that war happening. So while the stakes can be high, what matters more is which side accesses them than which side raises them. The last big question is does deterrence work? Can Russia be deterred? If so, can it be deterred indirectly? 
by strengthening relationship with another country rather than directly confronting it, or does it see that as a sign of weakness? Is Russia already being deterred and just making a lot of noise and conducting very expensive, very long-term military exercises on the border just to keep its own people distracted and to extract concessions from the West? Are there people in Russia who can be deterred even if Vladimir Putin can't? Is NATO a credible deterrent? What would they have to do to become one if they are not? Does deterrence work better when it comes from the individual members of NATO or from other organizations like the EU? Or does NATO enhance rather than detract from deterrence? That's the question that at least one final focus from one side in pretty much every round of nationals is probably going to come down to. Is NATO getting involved more part of the solution or part of the problem? Is it what instigated Russia, or is Russia just claiming that as an excuse? Would a show of strength from NATO be enough, or is it too late? A lot of con teams on this topic are going to make arguments of, okay, that would have been a great idea three months ago, but it's too late now. A lot of teams are going to make arguments on this topic of, okay, this would be a good way to influence Russia, but it would be better if NATO didn't get involved in it and distract them with a more military solution. The pro side has a much narrower path to walk on this topic. Like I said, there are two clauses that restrict it. It's not just NATO should strengthen its relationship with Ukraine. It's not just NATO should deter further Russian aggression. The method and the goal are both set. So pro is going to be playing a lot of defense on this topic. This means that pro needs to have an internally consistent story. This means if Kong gets to speak second, there are a lot of things they can do to disrupt it. This means that Pro probably wants to choose to speak second when they get the chance, and probably wants to use that to start refuting and defending against what they know Khan's points to be early on. Again, the big questions on this topic are what kind of assistance is needed, what topical action can NATO take, what is Russia going to do next, what is going to happen between now and nationals, what parallels exist, both contemporary and other countries and historical, what are the stakes, and does deterrence work? The team that can answer those questions better is going to have a huge edge debating this topic at nationals. If you have any other questions on this topic, you know exactly how to contact me, go ahead and do so, and I'll try and put up a follow-up dealing with them in more detail. Good luck, happy researching, and hope this makes a difference.